Welcome everyone. I'm Diane Brenneman and I'm happy to welcome you to our second session in partnering with parents to support their children's sexual development. It's a great day to talk about the birds and the bees, isn't it? I'd like to welcome Judy Worth as our speaker today. She combines business administration degree from the University of Iowa with only over 25 years of supporting people with disabilities to meet the labor needs of folks in Colorado, Illinois, and Iowa. Her diverse experiences as a behavioral specialist, job developer, consultant, and trainer bring a unique brand of insight to issues of employment and people with disabilities. Delivering employment services in rural and urban areas, she has developed partnerships with a great variety of industries. In addition to supporting businesses, Judy has worked with people with disabilities to dream and speak for themselves and their families to plan and address the issues of entering the workforce. Because she believes that all people who desire to work in the community can, if given the proper supports, Judy is creative and skilled at designing strategies to make that happen for both the worker and the employer. Judy's also completed the Elevatus uh, training on sexual educa sexuality education. Um, and these are the folks that are going to be offering our November 2 workshop. So um, this training is to educate individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the staff working with them, and their parents. So welcome, Judy, and we'll look to you to introduce your panel when the time comes. All right. Um, sorry, you guys, I just blew in from the transition clinic. So there's a bit of a shift in this brain going on that, um, <laughs> that is going to take a second. Although interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the last individual I saw was a young, um, a young person who identified as they who is in the midst of beginning the transition process um, physically, which seemed appropriate given where we're heading today. As we begin to talk about this, I should also just disclose that I, my job was to facilitate the panel, so I'm hoping they all make it. Um, Diane, if you can watch for Ed and Kelsey, I see Joey is here. Will do. Um, and also we wanted to say that we expected Ellen Uhlberg, but she had a physical um, complication. She's not able to be here. So Judy is pinch hitting and we really appreciate that, Judy. So you guys, what comes out of my mouth is really un unheard of. You'll never know. Ooh, we, we, did all, <laughs> we all did complete the Elevatus training, which is really, um, in my opinion, a really important tool that we have that can help us as we're going through, as we're looking at how do we create and how do we um, support people in having their sexual identity and identifying who they are. I really wish you people would show your faces, I'm just saying, so I can see who I'm talking to. You can chew and spit and do all that, but it's lots easier to talk to faces than it is to pictures. I'm just saying, it's all about me, okay? So, um, we're going to cover, Ellen's part of this was we're going to talk about sexuality and health, some things in the lit, um, perspectives. I want to hear your perspectives because um, this is going to get infused with Judy think here. So sorry, guys. Um, but I want to hear your perspectives, how you were oriented to what sex is and what's all the, all the things that go along with it. There's no hotter topic, literally and physically, than sex. Um, yet so many people, especially those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, are excluded from information on it. And we know that individuals with autism are really wrestling this. And so this is very real for your day-to-day -day work. Okay, so I want to, your perspectives on this will be as important as anything that I can show you in the literature. Um, then we'll talk about our role and some general tips. How do we coach people through this? How do we help them navigate this time? And we're gonna have a self-advocate panel. Um, I've got some general questions for them, but uh, they've, they've all agreed to be open to your questions as well. So that as you're working with families, you're able to better help them. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Elevatus training, huge plan, huge fan of it, because um, I ran across their materials a few years ago and it's so beautifully broken out in ways that that teach about the difference between what is private 
what is public what sort of people what sort of person is this in your life is this a friend a family member a helping professional a helping professional a close friend a distant friend and it's really really well um, put together in a way that is accessible to an array of workers with uh, an array of learners with diverse needs and their mission um, is to empower and motivate and educate self-advocates, staff and parents to gain confidence, comfort, knowledge and the skills to teach and talk openly about sexuality, which will enable people with developmental disabilities and all people to lead sexually, sexually health lives. And I'd say sexually healthy lives there, I think. Okay, um, and um, the cool thing about this curriculum, which I know you're gonna hear about, is there's a key component for self-advocates, but there's also secondary curriculum components for family members and those people supporting folks. And I'm gonna, I'm confident they will share that with you, so I won't jump into that, okay? So our goals today, I want you to gain some knowledge, gain some knowledge about specific issues faced by people with developmental disabilities. I want to explore our values. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone should get a little itchy. Now that, then you can shut your faces off again when we start talking about sex and go, oh, you wanna talk about this on where anybody can see me, okay? But you have to own your own before we can help anybody else. And then we wanna identify our role. How are we gonna help people in addressing these key topics? including sexual rights, sexual expression, and hopefully understand some ways to more effectively communicate or at least listen to people um, and their parents and guardians through our panel. Anything you guys wanna add? All right, then we're going. All right, so this is your first interactive component of it, if you would. Um, you can either join us at slido.com on your second, or you can use your phone and simply hop on, kick your camera, zoom, kind of get close to that, that little code there, the QR code. And when it puts down the Slido thing underneath it, there you go. It will take you, and we're gonna describe three words about how are you doing today? How are you doing today? And let's see what happens. <laughs> Allergies, interesting, I love it, you guys. This totally embodies Ellen's kind nature to ask how you are feeling. I'm not that nice. I would have asked you to put down your words about sex. When I say sex and I say disability, what words do you put in now? Let's watch this change, okay? This is great. You guys are doing a great job of participating. I appreciate that. But let's just have a little fun. I came from, from clinic. So now we're saying sex. How do you feel about that sex? and? and the families you're talking to. Awkward, anxious. Oh, look how numbers, how these things have started get, changing rapidly. I love it when I misread. Whoever put in enjoying the autumn coolness, I must be hungry because I thought it said cookies. And I got very excited.
could not take a moment without writing a word on here. Um, this is not something that I expect anybody to share anything, but I want you to take a moment and reflect on how you feel about talking about sex and how it changes from audience to audience. How you talk with sex of, about, about sex with your children, how you talk about it with your spouse or partner, how you talk about it with your friends, and how you would talk to another family about it, or how you would talk to an individual with lived experience and disability about sex. Are there differences? Wait, oh, you, this means yes, this means no. Okay. And Diane, if there's anything in the chat, Judy can't see it because of the way the computer's set up. So just tell me. I will keep my eye on it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So I think all your feelings about this are really, really normal and natural. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, it's the era we were brought in, the structure of our family, our core beliefs all affect. Um, how we interact with others regarding sex and sex education, okay? And there is some literature out there on this, okay? And according to the U.S. Sex Information and Education Council, you know, human sexuality is not only just what happens, but it's our knowledge, beliefs, values, attitudes, as well as the people who are interacting, the behaviors that they engage in. Okay, and it, there's, of course, the, the physiological part of it, but there's also the emotional component of it. And that's what I love about Elevate is because it's talking about sexual self-advocacy. How do we help people have their voice and an effective voice in this, er in this arena? How do we make sure that they can, um, that they can take care of their, their heart? in the midst of this very biologically driven event. And as we're talking about young people, which is who most of us are dealing with, am I correct? Okay, just wanna make sure. And think about, now here, let me just take a trip for some, some of us down memory lane. Think about the first time you had sex or were sexually attracted to somebody. In the chat box, throw in a couple words about how that was, the feelings associated with and all the things you had to juggle in that moment. Ooh, I can't see the chat. Box. Joey says it was unexpected. I would add it was highly anticipated. Judy says scary. Uh, I was young, so it was scary. I didn't know she was interested in me in that way. Confusing. Fun. Exciting, overwhelming, but not in a bad way. It's a lot to take in. So many expectations colliding with so many realities. Mm -hmm. Uncomfortable, but exciting. Deviant, felt deviant. Great, thank you guys for, for putting that out there because isn't it interesting? Very few of us brought up the, the biological component of it. We all brought up the emotional component of it. And that, that's really what they're saying here is there's so many factors. And by the time you factor in the physiological component of it, how it feels, how you know, your fear of pregnancy or whatever the case may be, and you combine it with what I know about this, and then you 
fact that my family's beliefs, my beliefs, my religious beliefs, my moral beliefs, whatever, my cultural beliefs. Um, when Ed joins us today, he will talk about culture because he's from Africa and there's a whole lot of different feelings about sex in Africa. All right. Why is this so important, you guys? It is so important because we know that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are so far more to, at risk of being sexually abused. I mean, just look at these key facts. More than double the pregnancy rate. If you have a cognitive impairment, increased risk of STA, of sexually transmitted infections. Almost triple for male, almost triple for female. Increased risks for pregnancy, as we said. Um, and they happen more often than, they, than we give them credit for because we are biologically driven for it. Okay. And uh, with the youth I work with, I always hope that there is romance, that it's more than sex, it's romance that there's, there's those emotional ties. But if you think about all these sort of things that we have to, to, to factor in here, there's a lot of teaching that has to go along. A lot of teaching. So people, people tell us there's a lack of, of, of sexual, of sex education for people, especially that's tailored for people with, intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. And the, the, much of the, the coursework that you'll see in schools based on what I observe is really the biology of sex and how to, permit, how to prevent um, sexually transmitted diseases and how to avoid pregnancy. But think about it for a second, what else do we need to be teaching about? What else do we need to talk? Things, take again, take a trip down memory lane. What sort of things regarding um, sex or reproduction or whatever, did your family help infuse in you? Pop it in the chat box, consent, oh yeah. Or you can unmute yourself and yell it out. You don't have to put it in the chat box. I'm cool if you talk to us. Don't make me call on you because I will. What other factors came into play? Jennifer's smiling because she thinks I am going to call on her. Oh, it wasn't talked about. Sex didn't happen in our house. That's right. Never talked about. So I will I'll gladly speak up. Thank you, Joey. Allison, what about at your house? Uh, it was very much wait until marriage. Mm -hmm. Coffee? I can, I can only really recall like one conversation, so not, not really excited to talk about it. Mm-hmm. We were yeah. farmers, and when I asked mom, she said, well, you've seen what the animals do, and I didn't know what they did. <laughs> I'll, I will add there was one talk, but I'm going to save that for the panel part. I will save that. Save it for us, Joey. Save it for us. Yeah. I'm from I'm a not... family of four girls, and I always thought that they should have said something to us, and they never said anything to any of us. I guess they just hoped <laughs> we'd be careful my mom um took me to the library and maybe check out a book on sex <laughs> renee renee makes note that pretty open generally she was raised around a large group of lesbians to so learn early about um lgbtq issues yeah and so you know the values of the people around us and the values of our family are just totally infused in this. And you know, it's interesting. P 
people with autism are seven times more likely to be gender non-conforming than, than the general population. Interviewed at gen, gender clinics, 10 times more likely to have the autism, the diagnosis of autism than general public. And so part of the reason this is so critical is we have to be able to listen. So what do you guys think? What are some of the potential co causes for this gap in care? Why do you think that people with intellectual disabilities are probably getting <laughs> less than we did? I would want to say, for starters, stigma, as in myths around it. I think last week I was at the April conference and this comp and this topic did come up. Sex is an independent living skill. That's one of the things I remember. But um, yeah, it's the stigma of the myths like um, individuals with disabilities, they don't. They don't want sex, they're asexual. They don't want it, they don't have the drive for it. But then there's also a contradicting myth like, oh, they're hypersexual. Like when I reread those for the, the April conference event, I was like, well, okay, so which myth is it? Stay consistent, but um, yeah, there's so yeah, there's a lot of myths and stigmas that are around that because it's like, oh, they don't need that. Why do they need that? It's not important. You know, Rochelle, um, I appreciate your comment that some people think that people with disabilities shouldn't have sex. I remember I was a um, a behavior specialist in a large ICFID, and um, I was often called in to deal with people who were sexually inappropriate, people who maybe um, touched people or um, engaged, you know, in masturbation, um, all kinds of different things. And it was a relatively conservative place. And, um, and there was definitely a core belief that people should not have sex before marriage. And so my response was, are you gonna let them marry? And they said, absolutely not. And so my argument was we had to come up with some way because I, I can remember uh, a man who I worked with who was often in trouble because he was persuading other people to um, help him masturbate because he couldn't, he was so spastic, he was strapped in his wheelchair. So he'd, per he'd persuade young, um, other young residents and sometimes in these facilities, the young people, the, the direct care workers are young women in high school. And I can remember, I can remember them coming to me and saying, hey, Judy, you got to do something about him. I said, why? And apparently he had persuaded one of the direct care workers to trim his pubic hair while he was, while they were bathing him, um, which actually isn't that obnoxious of a thing. Although his motivation for it was definitely because it was, enjoyable to have a young woman touch his genitals, you know? And all I could do is smile. And it's like, we need to empower ourselves to be able to say, I'm not comfortable doing that. But he wasn't wrong in asking. You know, that's all I could say is he's not wrong in asking if she, she could have said no. So what do you think are the reasons for the gaps? Joey's throwing out a couple. What else? There are people, Rachel, Rachel has put out that some people think that People with disabilities shouldn't have sex. Maybe we think they're not going to understand. Okay. Yeah, maybe we don't have the tools and the words and we're, con we're not confident they'll understand. Or we don't know how to. Yeah. So let's take a look at this. Here are things that we see. This is what, again, the literature shows that it's not seen as a priority or as a need. They aren't going to do it anyway. And if they, they, you know, they shouldn't. If we talk about it, they'll do it. It's like, it's like the discussion that we hear right now about gender identity. If we talk about it, they're all going to, you know, this is going to be an issue. Um, I don't think that's the case. Just like if we talk about um, 
about sex and the role it plays in our lives that everyone's going to engage in more or less and joy you hit on it you know that that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are either innocent they don't want to ever have sex or they're hypersexed or if they experience this they're not going to be able to manage it and we got problems yeah yeah, I'm looking at that sheet again that had a list of all those myths and yeah, there's more of them like, well, they're inadequate to do it to like, oh, disability is linked with sin, even, which I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh, sure, sure. And uh, oof. yeah, some of them are, again, some of them contradict each other, which is like, again, that not wanting sex, hypersexual, and some of them like, which is it? Which one? Yeah. So yeah, great, great points. And then we've got this overall societal notion that sex is taboo, you know. Um, and you know, it would be untruthful of any of us to not say, um, then can you invite Kelsey directly from the meeting into yeah. uh, I'm on the phone with her and working on it. You can uh, invite her directly I, from the I just meeting. did. I just okay. did. Will you do the same thing for Ed? Because I'm not I just seeing did. him. Oh, You're on it. I Thank you. Um, you know, it's it's one of those tricky, tricky things that um, that here we have somebody who's making ten dollars an hour, and as we talk about Amber Allen, as one of our land trainees, talks a lot about the challenges that we face when um, when you have people who have physical and intellectual disabilities or just even physical disabilities and need support, need help to engage in a healthy sexual life. Boy, that's when it gets awkward for us, right? All of our things come into play. We avoid it because we're not comfortable. If we don't talk about it, if I close my eyes, it's not there. And many people don't make the time. They're just not making the time. And then we've got the, in, the inconsistencies that one person says it is a-okay if you do this and somebody else says that's wrong you can't do that or it's good bad okay so these the all these things cause it all right what are the benefits so here you get to vote another slido okay so let's do it again see what we get Looks like we've got a pretty active winner here. Bottom line, it is the first one. The second one, it has me interested in it in the respect of, we don't want people to engage in sexual activities, but isn't dance a sexual activity? I mean, aren't many of the things that we do, um, mating rituals that we engage in 
in the public. Um, it's one of the things I, I am ashamed to admit that after I drink some alcohol and sit, sit in a bar, watching the dance floor is highly entertaining because it is the human mating ritual in action. It's national national geographics with you know in a in a in a communal place. The benefits of it are pretty clear. Knowledge is power, and the absence of knowledge leads to abuse and to people doing things that get them into trouble. Um, I will tell a story around this that I think is that helped me understand the challenges of uh, and the importance of, of education and helping people to be able to make informed decisions. I worked with a young man who was constantly hooking up with 12 and 13 year old girls. He was 19. So after you're done cringing, um, he and I spent many an hour talking about you understand what's going to happen here you're gonna go to jail and then you'll have a whole new set of girlfriends and they won't be 13 or 14. And he looked at me exasperated one day and he said, Judy, do you think I'm not standing out in front of the field house or I'm not, I'm not going places where there are women my age, but they aren't interested in me. They don't wanna be with me. Yet these, these girls who look like they're the same age think I am hot because I can grow a beard and they want to be with me. When you factor in the hormonal explosion that is going on in adolescence at that age, combined with the lack of appropriate opportunity and the abundance of illegal opportunity, I went, wow, okay, I get it. Now, how do we deal with this? I don't know if that impacts you guys the way it did me, but it, it totally changed things for me. So the way we can do this is the best we can do to reduce those risks of perpetrating or being victim to this is to educate, support, and do it over and over and over until it starts to sink in. Okay, so we've got lots of things to consider. We've hit on this. Um, our comfort level. I jumped the gun. Ellen would kill me. We asked this question earlier. Ask yourself now what your current beliefs are. The messages people with disabilities receive are, you know, we're told they're not sexual beings, innocent, childlike. They shouldn't have sex and we need to protect them. Okay. It's low on their sex life is low on our priority list because we got other things to deal with. They can't have sex. It's very simple. They can't. And they don't want to have sex. They can't make good decisions about it. They would not be able to be good parents. And they're different than our family, other family members. Anybody heard those before? Why and what do people with disabilities and intellectual disabilities want to learn? How to make it last. You guys, these are the same questions that we ask, aren't they? How do we make them last? How do we, how do we have, how can we be safe? Um, we all have desires. We want to know that this is our right and it can't be taken away unless it deserves to be taken away. Get good information. And, you know, people want to find love. They want to not be alone. So when we talk about sexual self-advocacy and then we're going to move into uh, parents, but here's what, here's what it means. Speak up for yourself. Get information, show respect to yourself and others, and understand your rights and responsibilities. Parents are saying, we don't talk about that in our family. We don't know how to start. What if we make them more curious? 
Our child hasn't talked about it. How many of you talked to your parents about sex? How many of you, how many of you broached it? Good. Some of you are rock stars and that's why you're in the healthcare, the healthcare industry because you're fearless. Okay. But many young people don't. So here's Ellen's advice. Don't judge. Don't try to change people. Don't, you know, replace, you know, make sure that people are having a mammogram. They're having pap smears. It's our job to provide that sort of positive situation to be able to talk about it and to offer tools and information and connect people to resources. And on that note, I want to end the slideshow because I have some people here who can say it so much better than I can. So Judy, we have um, Ed and um, Joey here. Um, Kelsey cannot get in, but she is listening through my cell phone. And we're going to try having her answer your questions through my cell. Kelsey, do you want to say hello and see if it works? Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Let's okay. try that. Okay, cool. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Great. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the hassle for that, Kels. It's okay. So I just, I've never had this much trouble with Zoom, Judy, and it, it's a, it's a, it was a big, a little bit of a struggle. <laughs> well, and the link out of here, Kelsey, requires you to, to register. She tried that. But yeah, that's what Diane was telling me. And she's so, getting an error. So I think this is all right. We can We're going to go with this. All right. So um, we really appreciate you guys' willingness. Ed, you want to show your face? I saw it earlier. All right, so, oh, I rearranged you. There you yeah. go. All right, so I'm trying to get these guys all organized in a way so that I know who I got here. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put out a few questions, and then I want you guys to feel free to ask your questions as well. So. Joey, I'm going to start with you. Thank you for jumping in on the discussion earlier. Okay. Um, I figured because I did have information to share. So. Well, I appreciate appreciate that. Um, hold on, I grabbed my wrong questions. I have another panel immediately following this, so there's only a slight confusion. You guys have been very gracious. So, Joey, when you were in school, um, what sort of classes did you take that you think helped you? Um, understand about sex and understand yourself a little better? Well, uh, I'm going to try my best not to sound negative, but this is going to be tough to do. So in terms of classes, so first off, growing up in a rural area, you really do not have a lot of accesses to resources or have someone that is fit into that like profession to talk to about. The closest you have to talk to about that kind of stuff would be, again, either your family or you got lucky and you had a teacher or like a health care profession professional that you could talk to. So basically courses, the bare minimum was only required to take the bare minimum. And this wasn't because I had a disability because I didn't know I was disabled until 25. So this was like, oh, this is all they need to do. So earlier you talked about like the components about sexuality, sex and everything. A lot of those components, the emotional, behavioral, and all that stuff, wasn't taught that. So what I was taught, this was um, basically the math teacher was the one that took care of also the health class. So when it was time to talk about sex and stuff, so the boys would be divided up. The boys and girls would be separate. The girls would have, they'd have the, they'd have the biology teacher be the one to teach them. So it's like... I was more thinking about why is the bi biology teacher teaching them something while I'm learning this stuff from the math teacher. I'm like, why? So the presentation itself was very basic, just basically physical components. This is what this part of the body is. This is what this part of the body is. This is what you do it do with. 
And I remember one line that he said, sex is well, is about procreation. Yeah. And plus, no, he only, this was only from the perspective of people that were heterosexual, straight, as in if you were any topic related to LG, LGTB, any of that. Yeah, good luck. You weren't going to get that. So, and looking back, I know there were a few classmates of mine that, well, they were, they were gay. They were, they were lesbian. It was like, they're learning the same stuff we're learning. I'm now looking back wondering, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? They're like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. But I don't feel like I want to do that. So I'm like, right away, their identity is like being challenged. I mean, it's not on it's not fully on like a purpose, but it's more like, oh, I'm wrong. I'm not right or something. That's maybe what they're feeling. But yeah, I had like also tons of questions I wanted to ask, but eh, good luck. The answers were like, no, that's not related to what we're talking about. So no, we'll, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got into more trouble than actually, actually for the questions I had. It was like, huh. so I felt so underwhelmed from it. I went, you know what? I'm going to learn myself. So yeah, I willed myself to look up on the internet, look up, look up any books on the subject matter. Yes, which that meant uh, I had to encounter the second purpose that the internet was made for besides funny cat videos. Yeah, porn. Which porn, no, is a terrible teacher. It can teach you the physical act, but... No, I, I would not recommend it. I would definitely not recommend what I did. But again, I was pushed to that because it was like I wanted to know more. I felt like my development was hindered because, because I'm like, why is this such a big secret? Why am I getting like one lesson that lasts about an hour and a half? I think, And I will say, I think I've learned more in the past two weeks or relearned in the past two weeks just this in the April conference than in that entire class. It's like, yeah, yeah it's, um, so yeah, again, yeah. it just basically cover all the basics. Um, so overall, no, I don't think it, it helped me at all. I think, and I know I do have, and I have at least like anecdotal evidence in the form of like, well, when I got into college, that's when I got into a relationship. I, high school, I decided, well, if this is not that important, I'm gonna like, yeah, I'm not gonna focus on it too much. Even though, it would have been nice to date. It would have been nice to have a girlfriend. And I know, I know from personal experience, I know I had a couple of people that had like a crush on me growing up, but eh, bad luck in the terms of like, well, they moved elsewhere. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Kelsey, yeah. Ed, was, was your experience different in the respect of school? Anything different in terms of how your, how school was for you in terms of talking about sex? Um, I mean, for me personally, um, I had uh, I had sex ed uh, or took sex ed and everything. I mean, they explained like all like w you know what to expect and stuff. I would say it was pretty normal as far as you know learning about sex and stuff. Um, so I mean, I would say it was pretty normal. Yeah. Ed, how about you? For me, it was the same as Kelsey. I had glasses that I took. I think I think I have class which then led to that part of sex, sex related lessons, but also just my culture. I first not 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 related to that. So it provided the opportunity for me to learn. More, more about other people's culture and and their way of living in terms of having it, having sex in a related manner and everything that I learned there was very important to me because as someone who comes from a different country, I had to, read, to learn a different way of and respect people's boundary and not to get myself into trouble at all. <laughs> and so let me let me shift this question. And Ed, I'm gonna start with you. 
Um, what did your family do to help you learn and understand about sex and your sexual development? What role did your family play? I think my dad, my dad bought us a book related to that. So we kind of learned from the book. One of the book for was about teenagers and and what teenagers do. So my dad, my dad read us that book, and then we 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 kind of read it, read it over the time. So it was basically the dating part part of part of it, which why but why when you are asking someone out, you don't think about sex. Sex. So I learned that way to to to, to be. To read that book that way, and that helps me know that 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 sex have responsibility. I also watched movies about it, so those are some of the areas that that I learned. Sure. Tell us. Uh, Oops, sorry, Ed. Go on, fine. Okay. Tell us what did you what did your family do to help you learn about um, and to help you in your sexual development? Yeah, um, well, for uh, personally for me, I was, so my mom had bought, had, had also bought a book like a cart with cartoon drawings to just like show. But also the other thing that was very, very helpful was we, uh, we had conversations about um, related to sex and I, and, you know, I, she gave the sex talk at like 13 years old when I was 13 and, and she was like, well, the sooner that, you know, the earlier, the better, you know, that, you know, she knows. So she was able, we were able to have, and we still have conversations to this day, but starting out, she was able to be able to help me understand sex and what it is. I knew, uh, you know, up until that point, I knew bits and pieces, but it it was just nice to be able to sit down and talk to her, even though it was embarrassing. Because <laughs> no no kid wants to sit with their parent and have the birds and bees talk, but it has to happen at some point. So I would say that for me, it was just it, having to be being open is what's been great for me, being able to share my thoughts and my feelings. And it really, really helped in school because that topic isn't easy for anyone. Um, so, but I, but I personally thought it helped uh, me just for her being able to be open. So, it really was great having. Uh, it's great having open communication. And for uh, you know, for my mom and I, she's always been very open with me. And so, it, just great having those conversations. Kels, can I share a little bit more information and not ask you to share it? Or you can if you want. Well, oh, okay. I think that Kelsey, Kelsey's mother was, Kelsey's family was committed to Kelsey having the opportunity to have a healthy um, and pleasurable um, physical relationship with a partner. Yep. And uh, and I'll, I'll give you the option to share. I'm not gonna go into detail or anything, but they actually worked with um, people in the Department of Physical Therapy to assure that Kelsey could have an, a pleasurable and enjoyable um, sexual relationship by meeting with, with therapists to help with some of the physiological issues that the family did a great job of equipping Kelsey with the emotional and the values. But there were issues in terms of how do you make sure that a person who has some physical disabilities is in a position to um, be sexually healthy and enjoy, more importantly, let me rephrase that, the goal was that Kelsey could have a pleasurable sex life. Um, is that fair to say, uh, Kelsey? Did I say too much or too little? Uh, no, you. Uh, I I would have said the same thing, but I'm actually really glad you shared it because I uh, I appreciate that. But yes, I agree with everything you just said. Um, that's exactly what they did, and personally, I feel great that they were able to. Uh, that they wanted me to do that because it helped me to get prepared, um, as you were saying. So it really, really helped. Um, and I certainly just, um, I, I look back at it and think that was really good. 
Um, <laughs> and so it was uh, just, it was just great. So yeah, mom and mom and my dad, you know, they've both been very supportive. <laughs> Yeah, and so I want to share that because that, you know, just you knowing that story opens the door for dialogue with family members who go, um, we do know people who have taken this and made a commitment to assuring their, their child can have a healthy and pleasurable sex life. Um, Joy, do you have anything short to say to that? Because then we'll go to our third question. That your, what things your family did to help in this process? Well, I can I can definitely keep it short. So, uh, well, basically, they they weren't the biggest supporters. They weren't the biggest help. Now, they were supportive in a in a degree of like my mother wanted wanted me to be in a relationship. She wanted me to be married, stuff like that. She thought that was basically the ultimate goal that I should achieve for. Well, probably not the best approach. My father, well. He did have really good advice, really good insight when it came to friendships. He did. He said friendships have great merit and great benefits. So in that regard, but when it came to the actual talk, the time of the birds and the bees, I remember it far more for the wrong reasons, as in I remember how nervous he was, how anxious he was, because that was a rarity with him, because he, because this was my father. This was Harold Westlake. This was the guy who will walk up to two complete strangers from the Philippines and talk to them in their language like they're like they've known each other for years the same person again he'll talk to someone and just do it he has no anxiety and no nerves whatsoever nervousness to him whatsoever but here he is talking about it and I'm like what is he is he nervous he's talking about okay Girls don't have trees underneath their clothes. I'm like, what? Uh, what is he doing? I'm like, <laughs> I don't remember it for the reasons of like the benefits, the joys of it, relationship stuff. I don't remember it for that. I remember that, but yeah, it wasn't. So overall, yeah, it was not super supportive. It was difficult to talk about. It was so. And that could be because of their background and older generation. That's a possibility as well. As for any siblings, my brother and sister, not the biggest help in that either. I know my brother would say in his words, yeah, I'm the last person you want to come to, to, to about relationships, sex, and all that stuff. I can't help you with that. And I'll say, hey, at least he's honest. So, all right. But yeah, it's, I will also say, Kelsey, her, what the, uh, what the what the Kelsey's parents did that is very amazing that is something so let's uh let's ask I got one more question and I want just your one suggestion Kels what's one thing that you wish you knew or somebody had told you what's one thing that I wish somebody would have told me um, yep or that you knew uh, beforehand that I knew beforehand, I would say, uh, I would say that, um, that just, uh, you know, not that, you know, that uh, sex is normal, of course, but that, uh, that there's no need to be, you know, too nervous. Um, and, you know, just uh, um, to know you can ask questions. Joy, what's one thing you wish you knew? And then Ed will come to you. And then you guys, if you have questions. Let's see. Oof. This is actually the trickiest question because it's like, hmm, one thing. I mean, I'm technically technically gonna cheat and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say basically everything. I would say if if it were me, if I had like a time machine, I could go back in time to 15 year old and sit down and say, okay, I would without a doubt first talk about the benefits of friendship, and I would talk about also positive healthy relationships what are those and how you can you know talk to people i mean for me i'm still trying to figure out how do you talk about sex how do you talk about relationships how do you talk about this stuff even with friends that stuff is still a struggle and yes and also i would give my younger self uh here here's a couple of teams that won the world series and uh, uh nba championships and super bowls 
when you're 21, you can gamble. There you go. There. I would, <laughs> you know, just for, you know what, why not? I wouldn't tell him about, sadly, I wouldn't tell him about the relationship he'll have in college because I feel like that was important. That was. Ed, Still, what's, your, what, what's the one thing that you want that you would want to share? I think one thing I, I would turn on is it due to so every culture. We know that cultures are important to everybody, but I just learn, learn, learn the text that way, how I want to learn it, due to my culture being. And I wish I knew more, more, about, more about it in terms of, of, of dealing with the culture and, and and that's the, that's what what the part I miss I miss the most of, the most of, most of the time because I came to with my dad when I when I when I when I was thirteen so that's that time I I was focusing on how can I be with a friend friend than than doing than having sex so I wasn't thinking about about sex or whatever so I wish I knew more more just my culture. Sure. All right, you guys, we got two minutes for questions. Encourage people to either unmute and ask your question directly, um, or you could type your question in if you're more comfortable. You can tell that this is a very open panel. Uh, Renee asks, do you have suggestions for helping someone with disabilities understand their impact on others if they inappropriately touch or hurt someone? I think how it does. I think the most important thing is to ask questions. Whether, whether it's like whenever hugging someone, you, it's so we had to know when to do that. And so it's so funny because some, some people hug you and 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 feel awkward sometimes, but 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 asking people questions on how my, how is this is this, can I hug you or can I can I can I do something something that isn't gonna harm you but it's gonna be a reflection of your own Hello. That's what I would say mostly asking question question and being open minded. Um I would add on to what, what Ed said there. I would well for starters I talk about the concept of consent. As in as yeah, it is inappropriate to touch someone that didn't ask to be touched. That's the thing. Ask. Ask to say, hey, can I? Can I? And if they say no, that's their that's their right. That is their that's their ideal. And yeah, an easy way to remember it: um, consent is freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific, which is an acronym for fries. Yeah, that's from the April conference event I went to. Yeah, <laughs> Kelsey, I wonder if you have answers to that question. Judy just said she's got to step off here to her next thing, but. Uh, Kelsey, how would you help somebody with disabilities understand if they inappropriately touch or hurt someone? Yeah, um, well, uh, for me personally, I would just say, you know, if a person says no, then that means, you know, if, if they don't want to be touched, then you need to respect that. Respect is huge, especially when it comes to sexual uh, relationships. Uh, you need to have respect and you need to, if, and if, if, you know, if, if a person does not consent, then, you know, then that means they may not, you know, they don't want to be touched. So consent is also very important. So for, from coming from me, respect and consent are the two things I would say are huge um, in for sexual relationships, but, you know, just in general, but particularly when it comes to sex, yeah. Well said. Well, I want to thank Joey and Ed and Kelsey so much for being vulnerable and being with us today. Um, and I'll thank Judy in absentia. 
There is a link there uh, for an evaluation. Anyone attending today, we encourage you to click on that link uh, before you sign off. So uh, you can offer us your uh, feedback and uh, we can improve in the future. And thank you all is, for attending. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, being here. Have a great day, all. I was happy thank to you. talk and hope yeah. I could do this again sometime. Thank Thanks, you. Joey. Thank you. Um,